killing crypto. <coughs> so uh, this is an interesting story, but it kind of connected a lot of dots for me in terms of what I've been seeing uh, over the last few months, uh, really over the last two months, it's happened pretty quickly from the Biden administration um, and, and uh, from uh, elements within the Democratic Party and then from regulators throughout the administration. And that is a real concerted effort, a real concerted attempt by the, this administration to try to uh, kill off crypto and, and to do so in kind of subtle, hidden ways without having to declare that that's what they're doing, without, uh, <coughs> without announcing any change in policy, really, without alienating maybe a lot of the people who hold crypto directly, uh, because there's been no change in policy. So this is kind of a stealth, a stealth way uh, to try to kill crypto. Uh, let's call it, and, 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 and a lot of this I'm taking for Pirate Wires, which is a Substack I subscribe, subscribe to in an article Nick, written by uh, Nick Carter. And um, the, uh, the, let's call this Operation Choke Point 2.0. Now, for those who, you who don't know what Choke Point 1.0 is, I, I think it's very, very, it's, it's, it's important that you know what it is. It's, it's a, maybe one of the low points in American, um, in American uh, uh, government policy, right? Um, in fascist uh, I implementation. Uh, so one of the great frustrating uh, frustrations of um, uh, government, and I'd say Democrats in particular who would like to control business and basically like to drive out of business those businesses they don't like, I don't know, Democrats had their way, uh, things like uh, payday, uh, payday loans, things like uh, gun manufacturers, uh, things like uh, private colleges, um, what other, there's a, there's a whole string of businesses that our central planners and uh, our uh, morality police and uh, the, the philosopher kings do not believe contribute to social well-being and um, think that it, it is bad for you and therefore they would like to basically drive those businesses uh, out of business. Um, and of course, you know, maybe, maybe in these days, in the, in, the, in the world in which we live today, they were, what they would really like to do is drive kind of oil companies out of business. They would like to drive fracking companies out of business. They would like to drive... Uh, uh, a lot of companies, you know, out of business. And, uh, but they can't. Uh, they can't because it's politically untenable. They can't because they don't have enough political power. They can't because Congress won't pass those bills. Even Democrats in Congress won't pass those bills. They just, it's impractical for them to actually shut down these businesses. That is, the, 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 the American people will flip out and go after them. I mean, they would like to shut down certain car companies that don't produce electric vehicles or shut down those parts, but they also can't really shut down the car companies because they call, the labor unions who are part of the car companies are supporting them. So it's complicated, right? The whole thing is complicated. Uh, but there's certain industries we know they, they don't want. They don't want certain pipelines to be funded. They don't want uh, certain businesses and you know things like, again, firearm manufacturers and uh, private colleges, for example, there was a whole thing about private colleges. Anyway, during the Obama administration, they came up with an incredibly creative way of doing this. Uh, and, and, and in my view, one of the worst examples of, uh, of government uh, abuse of power in American history, but one of these things that never go reported and nobody ever does a big deal out of them and nobody really reports them. Um, uh, this was actually called choke point. An idea was that, um, that uh, the Department of Justice uh, would go and meet with banks. Nothing official, nothing formal, no new law, no particular regulations. But basically, the Department of Justice would go and uh, take a, a member of the FDIC, Federal Deposit uh, Insurance uh, Corporation, or the OCC, Office of the Control of Currency, uh, both of which are uh, uh, bank regulators. And the Department of Justice would coordinate with the FDIC and OCC, and now it would go to banks, and they would basically encourage the banks to redline. 
not based on race, not based on income, not based on risk, well, they would argue that it was based on risk. They would basically tell banks, we don't want you to lend to risky businesses. We don't want you to lend to businesses that might get into legal trouble with the government because if you lend to those businesses then um, and they get into trouble with the government, then those are going to be bad loans in your books and we, the regulators, will have to come in and intervene. So what we'd rather you do is don't lend to them to begin with. Just don't lend to them. And they did this primarily with the big banks, but they did a lot of regional banks. And basically, they had a list of like a, a dozen industries that banks were requested not to lend any money to and not to have any banking relationship with. Firearm manufacturers, adult entertainment, and as I said, private colleges among them. And uh, I, I remember I was on a board of a private college at the time, and uh, basically the, the 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 college got a phone call one day from one of their from the the primary banker, and the banker said, uh, "Look, we have to we have to cut all ties with you guys." Why? It, well, because the government has suggested it, has, recommend, has recommended it. <clears throat> and um, they did. They cut all ties with the private college. The private college had to scramble and find a small, uh, a small bank uh, somewhere in, in California or, uh, to, to do business with. That bank had not come under pressure from the government, is were willing to take the risk because they, they needed the revenue, and, and they established a banking relationship, but the big bank had cut it off. And this was a mechanism to penalize uh, those poor. And the idea is to choke point is to choke capital. This was, in, uh, this was started in, uh, uh, this is, by the way, how the, Biden, uh, the, uh, sorry, the Obama administration got rid of the online poker business. Online poker companies were basically... They, they, they squeezed their banking relationships and they killed the industry uh, the, in, based in the U.S. through their banking industry, through their banking relationship. They couldn't take Visa, MasterCard, and so on. And now they were applying it to a mass of other industries. They, I don't know that they actually succeeded. I, I don't think, for example, the adult entertainment business I don't think the, the, the adult entertainment business uh, was, uh, has been choked off. It seems to be thriving. Uh, it, it did some damage maybe to the marginal, at the margin, but, uh, you know, uh, gun manufacturers, private colleges, I don't think that is what hurt them. Other things the government did hurt private colleges, but not that. This was a way to choke off capital from these industries. Anyway, much of that was reversed under Trump, although it continued informally under Trump, um, you know, Bank of America and Citibank deplatformed firearm companies. Uh, Bank of America, um, uh, you know, uh, began reporting client firearm purchases. This is in 2018 under Trump. In 2019, <coughs> AOC uh, announced her intent to marginalize private pensions through her seat on the private house. Financial Services Committee. I don't think she did anything or could do anything, but that was the intent. Anyway, over the last few months, really since the early December, since FTX kind of completely blew up, there has been an effort by members of Congress, the Fed, the FDIC, the OCC, and the Department of Justice to choke off crypto, basically to make the relationship between crypto and banks impossible, and thus to make it very difficult for crypto to basically to, to, to convert your, um, your uh, coins, your cryptocurrency, into dollars. Because for that, you need to go through a bank. So, for example, on December 6th, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Warren, John Kennedy, and Robert Marsh, Roger Marshall sent a letter to crypto-friendly bank Silvergate, scolding them for providing services to FTX and Alameda Research and lamblasting them for failing to report suspicious activities associated with these uh, 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 activities. On December 7th, Signature, another active bank in the crypto space, announced its intent to half deposits ascribed 
to crypto clients. Uh, you know, they were basically giving the crypto, uh, crypto customers their money back and shutting down their accounts. Crypto deposits dropped from 23 billion to 10 billion. January 3rd, the Fed, the FDIC, and the OCC released a joint statement on the risks to banks engaging with crypto. Not explicitly banning banks' ability to hold crypto or deal with crypto clients, but strongly discouraging them from doing so on a, quote, safety and soundness basis. On January 9th, Metropolitan Commercial Bank, one of the few banks that serve the crypto clients, announced a total shutdown of its cross-crypto asset-related vertical. On January 9th, Silvergate stock falls to a low of $11.25 on a bank run. There's a bank run because of the crypto exposure and insolvency fears. The bank dealt with the bank run. The, the bank actually handed over cash to anybody who redeemed their accounts. Um, you know, uh, uh, again, the... the um, the bank had traded as high as $160 a share, and now is it under 12. On January 21, Binance announced, Binance is a big uh, crypto exchange, announced that due to the policy at Signature Bank, they will only process user fiat transaction worth more than $100,000. Couldn't do small transactions. On January 27th, the Fed denied crypto bank Custodia's two-year application, two years to become a member of the Federal Reserve System, citing safety and soundness risks. Of course, everybody else who wants, who, who had an intention, all the other crypto banks who had an intention of getting a, a, a license from the Fed are now not applying. It's completely frozen in that market. The Kansas City Fed branch denied mm -hmm. Custodia's application for a master account, mm -hmm. which would have given it an ability to use wholesale payment services and to hold reserves with the Fed directly. Then on January 27th also, the Fed issued a policy statement which discourages banks from holding crypto assets or issuing stable coins and broadens their authority to cover non-FDIC insured state chartered banks. It's just a broadening of the Fed's authority without legislation, without anything. Um, and then... Um, you know, uh, so they are now regulating uh, state chartered banks like Estonia. Uh And you could go on and on and on. And uh, February 8th, Protegio and Praxis, applications to follow, uh, to, to obtain full approval to become national trust banks, still outstanding, 18 months. And they're probably going to be denied by the OCC. And you can see on and on and on a systematic approach by regulators to crush the crypto market. Now, as you know, I am not a huge crypto fan. Um, and, and, and I'm certainly not a, a, a crypto as money is going to replace the dollar fan. I don't think that's going to happen. But, let, you know, I am a huge believer in letting the markets work. Letting the markets work. All this will do, by the way, is drive, it, it'll crush the crypto industry, which is still looking for its killer app which is sad because there's a lot of innovation going on in this industry and there's a lot of interesting things going on and there's a lot of upside and potential going on. So some, uh, a lot of venture capital just won't flow to this industry and it's going to dry up and in that sense the regulators are going to be successful. But at the margin, what it's going to do is going to drive whatever is left and the investments in crypto overseas to other, other places where um, countries and places that, uh, that want, want the business and want the capital and want the flow of, of money. This, I mean, those other places are actually, you know, significantly less regulated and, and uh, significantly less developed uh, capital markets in the U.S. Much more opportunities for fraud and deception in those other markets. Remember, FTX was not in the United States because of excess regulations and excess controls and excess problems that they were having here. They were in the Bahamas, and of course, FTX landed up as a massive, uh, massive case of fraud. Uh, so this is going to drive uh, a lot of these businesses offshore into all kinds of places, all kind of, they can, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, places that don't have the best reputation for the rule of law. Um, and it's a shame. Here's a Here's a burgeoning industry. Uh, who knows what its upside potential is? Maybe it's very limited. Maybe there's nothing, maybe there's no there there. But until we let 
without letting the industry play out, we will never know. And the government here, as I predicted they would from day one, is actually trying to suppress them. I think this is just the beginning. I think there's going to be a lot more. Many in the crypto industry uh, are uh, kind of saying, okay, we'll wait it out. And when, uh, when uh, DeSantis comes back in office, all this will be reversed and we're back in business. I, I think they're deluding themselves. I, it's not clear to me at all that the, uh, a, reg uh, a Republican administration would be more friendly to crypto, particularly um, uh, towards uh, the, the, the possibility of, of um, undermining the dollar. But, you know, I, I, I think there's real delusion in the crypto space in terms of what government is going to let them <clears throat> get away with. But we will, we will see. But it's sad that we, we're not being allowed to see it play out. Maybe crypto, crypto is all just one pyramid scheme. Let's have it play out and let's see what happens and let's see how it, how it does. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content, and of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.